All right, good morning to those that are here at Faith Family Chapel and those of you that are joining us online. We're taking a break from the book of Ephesians uh, because it's Christmas Eve, and I thought that we would uh, tackle some things in regards to uh, the deity of Jesus Christ. God, Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Jesus was God in the flesh here on the earth. And that is causing major divisions within the world and their other religions, and I thought I would just approach that to the best of my ability this morning. We opened with the same scripture that we covered in Breaking a Bread. Today in the city of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Christ, the Lord. Father, we thank you for the words that you've left behind in your word. We ask that our hearts and ears are open today as we try to apply them in our own church. In Jesus' name, amen. Today in the city of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ, the Lord. This was a declaration made by all people believe Gabriel to the shepherds in the field. Can you imagine that? Some big, bright, white, scary guy shows up and says, hey, your Savior has been born today. And it was enough of an experience that they wrote it down and they put it in the Bible. It's been passed down for ages that this actually took place. There were multiple witnesses, yet there's conflict in the world that Jesus was actually the Christ, the Messiah, the Holy One, the one that was coming to save us from our sins. So it opens the door to the question, is Jesus God or just a good teacher? Is Jesus God or just a good teacher? Because that's the dilemma within the modern world, right? Those of us that are Christians, we claim that Jesus is God, but not all Christians, quote unquote, claim that. There are some sects within Christianity that do not believe that. They have other thoughts. But if you're Catholic or Protestant or Baptist or whatever, uh, you believe that Jesus was God in the flesh, brought to the earth to be a sacrifice for our sin, a one and only sacrifice. But a lot of the other world just thought he was a good teacher, a good guy, a holy guy at best. Just a man like you and me. He lived on the earth. He did his thing, he taught and said some nice things, and then he died. That was it, no more and no less. And that's a problem for us as Christians, because if that's the truth, if, that, if Jesus was only a man, uh, we have a problem. Because as we're going to go through, a man cannot save you from your sin. You cannot save you from your sin. I can't save you from your sin. It takes God and only God to be able to save you from your sin. So we're going to cover that. These are some of the major religions of the world. In Judaism, at best, Jesus was a teacher, and at worst, he was a false prophet, a blasphemer, deserving death. And that's, if you talk to the Jews of today who don't believe in Jesus Christ, it's not that they don't believe he existed, okay? He did exist, they'll tell you, but he was not a prophet. He was a false prophet. He was a blasphemer, and because of that, he was put to death, right? In Islam, Jesus was a prophet, but he was not God or a God. He was just a man. So they believed that Jesus was a prophet, a good teacher. He came onto the earth, and he, he told you a lot of good things about God and points you to Muhammad, the next prophet in line. So in their world, it went from Moses to Elijah to Jesus and then to Muhammad, okay? But Jesus was not God, and so he was just a good man. And the Jehovah's Witnesses claim that Jesus never claimed to be God. There is God, and Jesus was maybe even the son of God, but ne never God um, unequal. The Mormons... Jesus was first made, and then he progressed, and then eventually he became exalted to godhood after death. So Jesus didn't become God until he actually died, right? And in their mind, guess what? You, individually, can also achieve the same thing. It's not quite the same thing we believe, right? Buddha, or Buddhism, says the same thing. Jesus was not God, but rather an enlightened man like the Buddha, he was just another man like Buddha who was enlightened and taught a lot of good things about loving one another and obeying and all that other nonsense, but he was not God. 
And the Hindus basically think that Jesus is an, uh, an acria. I can't quite see the word now there because it's being brightened out or an avatar. Essentially, they think he was a lot of different things, but again, still just a man. Still just a man. So simply stated, the question as to whether Jesus Christ is fully God is the issue that divides Christianity from all other religions and and spiritualities. We believe Jesus was God. The other religions of the world do not believe Jesus was God. And that's an important thing as a Christian. You need to understand Jesus is God. I have conversations with other Christians, not naming my father today, oops, who believes in all of the things of the Bible and all of the good things Jesus did, but Jesus wasn't God. He was just another man. And, and, and because he was just another man, every man can achieve the same things that Jesus did. That's just not the plan. So let's move on. So it, it begs the question, can a mere man be good enough? Can a mere man be good enough? Jesus said he came to take the sins away of the world. Well, can a mere man be good enough to do that? Right? Job 4 says, Can a mortal be more righteous than God, or a man more pure than his maker? And the conversation Job is having and his friends are having with God. Can a mortal become more righteous than God or, or become more pure than the maker? See, See, in order for a mere man to be good enough to take away the sins, to be the unblemished sacrifice, somehow he's got to be more pure than God, a mere man. In Job 25, they have this conversation. It says, how then can a man be just before God? How can one born of a woman be pure? See, they understood the whole idea of the, of, of the sin that was caused in the garden. We're born... We're born uh, with um, sin from the garden, that it's eternal sin. We're not pure from the get-go. Luke 18, 19. Jesus says this, why do you call me good? No one is good except God. No one is good. Now, uh, the Muslims will jump on this, and they're like, see, even Jesus said he wasn't God because only God is good. And Jesus claimed he wasn't good. They don't understand the messaging that he's giving here. That's not his intent. He's trying to to make them understand only God is good, and a mere man is not good, and I'm a man, but I'm able to do the things that God does. So maybe I'm, what, more than a man? But again, if I just look at that sentence, Jesus said he wasn't good either. Only God was good. And then... In Romans 3, it says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, no one, not even one. Not one man in creation, no one is righteous, no one, in the eyes of God, right? So it gets to be a very interesting perspective. Can a mere man be good enough? Well, according to Hebrews, no, a mere man is not capable. So let's listen to what, how God dealt with um, sin from the beginning and how it was uh, taken care of and then how it happened when Jesus arrived. So in Hebrews 9, now in the first, uh, now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an, an earthly sanctuary. They're talking about the tabernacle. A tabernacle was set up in the first room where the lamp stand on the table and its consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is where the Ten Commandments were placed after Moses brought them down. The Ark contained the gold jar of manna, uh, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the Covenant. Above the Ark were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the atonement cover, but we cannot discuss these things in detail now. So he's not, you know, he's going in. So in the beginning, they built the tabernacle. The tabernacle was divided into some, you know, into holier, holy, holier, and on places, right? When everything had been arranged like this, the priests would enter regularly into the outer room and carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people 
that had committed it in ignorance. So, how did they deal with the sins of the people? Once a year, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies, all the way in, carrying the blood of an unblemished animal. We'll get to that. And basically uh, use that as a sacrifice for the people. Okay, for the people. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. So they're basically saying as long as that tabernacle was still going on in the world, that sacrificial system was going on in the world, we don't know what Jesus' real role was. It wouldn't happen until this was destroyed. Remember when Jesus was on the earth, he said, I, I will destroy this, I will destroy the temple in what? Three days, right? And when he died, the curtain to the Holy of Holies was ripped in half. Verse 9, this is an illustration of the present time, including the, that the gifts and the sacrifice being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of, of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. Get, I need, you need to hear this because he's going to repeat it. He said these were not able to clear the conscience. They were not able to clear the conscience. And he's going to go into describing what the difference was between what that sacrificial system provided then and what Jesus' sacrificial system provides today. Verse 11, But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, that's heaven, and that is not made with human hands. That is to say, it is not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifers sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. So what they were saying is that, yes, you were able to go to the priest, you were able to get forgiveness, but your forgiveness was the outward part of your body. Your flesh was being forgiven, but your internal soul, your conscience, was not forgiven because you're evil. You would continue to do the same thing over and over and over. How much more, then, will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our conscience from acts that, that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? Now, I want you to get this part. In the old ways, when, they, when the Jews would go and sacrifice, they would take an unblemished animal, right? First fruit. Um, and they would then sacrifice that animal, and that blood would then, you know, be shed for their sin. What the writer in Hebrews is telling you now, Jesus was unblemished human being. Now, we just read scripture that said it's not possible. How's that possible that he could be unblemished? Nothing is unblemished. We are all guilty of sin, but yet Christ was not. Somehow he came to the world. Somehow he came without <clears throat> the first sin from Adam and Eve. Somehow he lived a sinless life. He was unblemished, a perfect offering. Well, if man is not capable of doing that on his own, how did Christ do that as a man? There must have been what? More. And it says, because he was unblemished, and as we were able to hear, he will be able to cleanse your conscience, your soul, the inner you. Not only just the outside, the inner inside, once and for all. It says, for, verse 15, for this reason Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from sins committer, committed under the first covenant. So in the first covenant, when God came, he set up the Jews. He set up all the rules. He set up all of the offerings and all the sacrifices. Jesus came, and did he, did he say, I came to break the law? No, he said, I came to what? Fulfill the law. I am the new covenant. That's when we break bread, we drink. And he says, it's my blood, the new covenant. There's a new covenant. Jesus came into the world to give us a new covenant. That's where it gets weird with all these other religions that are like, well, I know he was there, and I know he was a good teacher, and I know he's a holy man. And I was a... He's basically saying, guys, that he came to bring a new covenant. 
If you don't believe that, how can you call him holy and a good teacher and smart and all that? He's crazy. <laughs> He's crazy. So we can't, you can't have one without the other. Verse 23. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, meaning we had the tabernacle, we had the sacrifices of the blood on the, on the unblemished animals as uh, a precursor to what Christ was going to do for us, right? We used worldly things to basically get ourselves to understand what was going to happen, and then when the heavenly thing shows up, he was able to do that once and, one, and once for all. And we should have recognized, that's what he's saying, the Jews should have picked this up. They should have picked this up, but they missed it. Verse 24, for Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands. That was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for, as, for us in God's presence. Nor did the, he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the priest enters the most holy place every year with blood. That is not his own. He doesn't have to sacrifice him more than once, which is why it gets a little weird for me when the Catholics basically say, once they start their communion process, right, they're actually bringing Christ back down to sacrifice him again in the bread and the wine. Well, it doesn't line up with Hebrews. He doesn't sacrifice himself again and again. He did it once. That's all it was required. Breaking of bread when he said, remember me, do this in remembrance of him, was mean, we remember the one sacrifice. We don't have to relive the sacrifice over. There's no power in that, right? So they got that kind of funky, to be honest with you. All right, 26. Otherwise, and why wouldn't he re-sacrifice himself? Otherwise, Christ would have to have suffered many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all, uh, the culmination of the ages, to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. His one sacrifice did away with sin. Just as the people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. Okay, so this hits all the reincarnation folks. <laughs> this is all the people that are like, uh, you know, I died and went to heaven, and then I came back, folks. It's a, you die once and you go to judgment. That's your lot in life. 27. You are destined to die one time, and then you go to judgment. That's the way it works. But, but, but I've, I've listened to many people who've said, I died, and then I went, and I saw a white light, and I did this, and I spoke to that, and I saw my mommy and my grandma and whatever, and then I came back. And the reality is the human brain is capable of all kinds of things. <laughs> all kinds. Of, when you dream, you come up with lots of really interesting things. And even if you're sincere, that's all great. My issue is, if it is real, it lines up with the word. If you describe things that don't line up with what is described in the world, in the, in the word, right? John went to what? Heaven. John saw heaven. John talked about it in Revelation, what it looked like, how it acted, what the size, all these things. If it doesn't line up with that, you made it up. Now, you may not know you, you made it up. You may, you, you may not know that, uh, you may really believe it, but my word, my, the way I judge it is, does it line up with what the scripture says? And if, and if it doesn't, then no. I'm sorry, I, I can't follow you. I can't believe in what you said. Verse 28. So Christ has sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Now, this is kind of a critical piece. I highlighted it for you. He came once to die for sin. So he is the ransom for sin. But get this, he comes back to bring salvation to those that are waiting on him. But I'm already saved. Not if you don't make it to when he comes back. Get, that's why Paul keeps telling you, run the race in order to win. Beat your body into submission. Contemplate your salvation with fear and trembling. You're nothing. You're on the road until Christ comes back. You're on the road till Christ comes back. Your life needs to demonstrate the commitment, the understanding of the sacrifice you claim as yours. It's more than, well, I just get a card and I get to go back to the world to do what I want. Hebrew writer tells you, 
He's going to bring salvation to those who wait for him. Wait. You know, stay in the vine. A lot of people don't want to cover that because, you know, as Christians, we automatically think, believe, and feel, well, once I make the call, I'm saved. Once you make the call, you are saved, but you got to make it to the end. Got to make it to the end. Stay in the vine. Stay in, in Christ. Outside of Christ, you are not part of the equation. You just understood a message for a period of time, but were not able to keep up. All right. So, is Jesus God? That's really where it comes down to. According to Hebrews, no man could have been a single sacrifice. He had to be God. And that's what we believe, that he was more than man. He was something beyond man. He was something pure and holy. And so because he was willing to sacrifice himself in the mortal flesh, because God can't be killed. <laughs> God the Father can't be killed. You know, it's always the one, well, what if there was a bigger God than God? No, no, no. God the Father cannot be killed. He can't die. He could never sacrifice himself in his form in order to be a sacrifice. Because in the beginning, he demanded what? Blood. He demanded blood as a sacrificial statement for sin. So in order to get blood, somehow he had to figure out, how do I get them blood that's pure and holy so that they can be saved? Well, I got the answer. I'll send myself down in the form of a baby. I'll become a man. I can do that. I'm God. I can do anything I want. I'm going to become a baby, and I'm going to show them that you can live a sinless life because I'm going to be tempted like everybody else. Look, Jesus was in, the, was in the desert for 30 days, tempted. He was starving. He was hungry. He was thirsty. And the devil kept saying, look, if you just give in to this, if you just give in to this, you just give in to this, I'll give you everything. And he was able to withstand all of that. He was able in his flesh to stay pure and holy at the same time being God who is pure and holy. So not only was his flesh pure and holy, his conscience, his inner being was pure and holy. Get the idea? That was the whole purpose, why a mere man can't do that. So is Jesus God? And this is the question that you can ask, because you're going to have people, I mean, look, I think the Muslims are really making a play for Islam right now. I think they're really pushing hard to prove that Islam is the only religion. Everything else is a lie, and you've got to be prepared for that. You've got to be prepared on how to answer that. And the answer really is, my statement is, Jesus was God. You don't believe Jesus was God. Well, he wasn't God. Well, I believe he was. Why? From your, from your Bible? You mean your corrupted word? Your corrupt, it's corrupt. They don't believe that, it, that it's real. They believe that it was just fabricated, man-made, and what have you. And they'll point you to all kinds of inconsistencies in the Bible that look like inconsistencies. And they basically just say, no, he was a man, and he died, and they lied. They wrote it down and said he wasn't because they wanted to do something else. It was all political. And they'll go on and on. And by the time they get done, they sound pretty good. They sound pretty good, Christian. But Jesus already warned us about this. And so you've got to put on the armor of God. You've got to have the belt of truth. You've got to know why God didn't lie. Jesus was God. All right. First witness. Let's pull them out. The demons. What? You're going to pull the demons out as a witness? Yeah. They're the first witness that Jesus was God. We're going to read in Mark 1. They went to Capernaum, and, 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 and when uh, the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. They all knew the guy was possessed. They all knew that he was possessed by a demon. And then the demon inside him says, You're the Holy One of God. That sounds pretty direct to me. It's the uh, same thing in Mark 8. And Matthew 8, verse 29, What do you want with us, Son of God? They shouted. You have come here to torture us before the, have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? So not only did they call him the Son of God means I'm the Son of God. See, I have people who go, well, we're all sons of God. No, we're all creations of God. And in Jesus Christ, in his sacrifice, we become heirs and sons of God. But it's only because of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. His blood allows you to be an heir. Otherwise, you're just a creation. 
You are not a son or daughter of God. You're a creation of God. In order to become an heir of God, you have to actually become part of the family. Well, how do you become part of the family? You have to believe in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You have to become adopted, just like you would in any normal family here today. So son of God means exactly what it means. It means Jesus was the son of God. Well, he's the son of the God. He is what? A God, at least, right? He's God. All right. First, Luke 4. At sunset, all who were with um, various diseases were brought to Jesus, and laying his hands on each one of them, he healed them. And demons also came out of many people, shouting, You are just a man. You're a holy guy. You're a good teacher. No, you're the Son of God. But he rebuked them. Listen to this. This is early in his ministry. But he rebuked the demons and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. He rebuked them. Some, for some reason in the beginning, he didn't want everybody to know yet. He was still building his ministry. And in Mark 3, it says, For he had healed so many uh, that, that had diseases were pressing forward to touch him. And when the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. All of this was witnessed. All of this was written down. All of this was put in a book for us to understand. The demons knew he was the Son of God. They knew he was the Holy One of God. So all the Jews around him saw the same message because they were there. He, remember, he wasn't with the Gentiles yet. He was hanging with his Jewish brethren, and they saw the demons calling him the Son of God. Witness one. Witness number two, the Pharisees themselves, the teachers of the law, they knew he was God. Luke 5. When they could not find a way to, to, uh, to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on a, on a mat. They're talking about the paraplegic on the map. Threw the ties in the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? How can for, how can, who can forgive sins but God alone? So the guy's lowered down in the mat. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. The guy is healed. And all the Pharisees and the teachers of the law that are watching this are like, who, only God can forgive sins. Who is this guy that he can forgive sins? Can a mere man forgive sins? Could a mere man have done that? They knew. Only God. Luke 7. He's uh, talking about a woman that anoints him. He says, you did not anoint my head with oil, but she, just, she has anointed my feet with perfume. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those at the table began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Who is this man that would dare to forgive, say he can forgive sins? He was at a table with, with a, a meal with the teachers of the law. There's another one I didn't put up here where Nicodemus was talking to Jesus and basically said, you have to be from God because there's no way you could do what you do as a mere man. And he was one of the preeminent uh, teachers of the law. And finally, in Matthew 26, the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the, oath by the living God, tell us if you're the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus replies, his own words, this is Jesus. So if someone said, Jesus never said he was God, yeah, whip this one out. Verse 64, you have said so, Jesus replied, but I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the mighty and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more? Uh, why do we need any more witness? Look now, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. In the final call, the Pharisees killed him because he was a blasphemer. He dared to call himself. God. He dared to call himself God, and therefore he was not worthy of life. 
Jesus was very, very clear. I am God. The Muslims will tell you he never said he was God. He never did any of that. Then why did the Jews kill him? <laughs> they killed him because he was guilty of blaspheming against God. You couldn't run around and say that you were God, or you the Son of God, or you the Holy One, or that you could forgive sins. That's blaspheming against God. That's death in the Jewish tradition, right? That's why they killed him. At the end of the day, they killed him because he kept saying he was God. And they didn't believe him. Let's look at some more witnesses. How about the angels? The angels. Luke 131. They're talking, uh, an angel is talking to Mary. So the angel told her, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father, David. The angel was a witness that Jesus was God. Same thing in Matthew, 20, Matthew 1. He's now talking to Joseph. Because <laughs> Joseph is contemplating, like, look, I got this pregnant woman that I didn't impregnate. Uh, she says she's got, you know, God in her. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. And he has a dream, and it says, But after he had pondered things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to embrace Mary as your wife, for the one conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Listen, if the Holy Spirit is the Father, he's probably from God. There's some God in him somewhere along the way, right? And finally, in Luke 2, today in the city of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This was a proclamation made to a bunch of shepherds in a field. Not one guy, multiple people heard the same thing. Jesus, the Christ, is born. The angel said he was God. The demon said he was God. The people that put him to death said he claimed to be God. How about some more witnesses? How about God the Father? Well, surely God didn't say he was God. Eh, let's look. Matthew 3, Mark 1, and Luke 3. They all say basically the same thing. This is about the baptism of Jesus. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, he, at the moment, the heaven opened up, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is my Son. Heaven opened. Now, when Jesus went to get baptized, it was not just him and John the Baptist. It was Jesus, the crowd following him, and everybody around. And guess what? They all heard and saw the same thing to the point where it was written in the scripture and protected for you and me to read in the future. Jesus was God. Okay, Mark 17, Mark 9, Luke 9, they all cover this. After six days, Jesus took, took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and they led him up to the high mountain themselves. Uh, this is the transfiguration, all right? There he was transfigured before them, and while he was still speaking, a bright, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love with him. I am well pleased. Listen to him. So at least in this particular point, there were three eyewitnesses, Peter, James, and John. Three of them wrote this down. God spoke. I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And finally in John 12, it says, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. He's talking about the time he was in the garden, praying just before he was, you know, uh, arrested. No, it is for this purpose that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice from heaven said, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And the, cr and the crowd standing there heard it and said that it had thundered. So it wasn't just Jesus. It wasn't just, you know, the writer of John. 
writing it down. There was a crowd there. They heard it. They communicated it. Thundering voice from heaven. Do you need a bigger witness than God himself? What more do you want? And finally, let's look at Jesus himself. Because that's the biggest complaint. What they say is the Bible is man-made, the Bible was, was fabricated, the Bible was written, and all, all of those things that I just read to you were false. Those were false witnesses and false documentation and blah, 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 blah. Jesus never said. Not only do they say Jesus never said, one guy, one of the Muslim communities, very, very smart, will quote scripture and verse, but leave out the parts where Jesus says. He, he quotes it and goes, yeah, he didn't say that. No, he didn't, he didn't say that. He did. Listen. This is what we need to understand in Matthew 16 and also in Luke 9. It says, Jesus asked, he's talking with Peter. Jesus asked, who do you say I am, Simon Peter? So, uh, Peter res responds, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus replies, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And then he admonished the disciples not to tell anyone he was the Christ. Again, he comes, I'm not ready yet for the world to know. They're not ready to hear this. I mean, they're already freaking out. I got more work to do. Peter says, he says, who, who am I? You're the Christ. Yeah. And the only way you could have got that is from who? God. So each and every one of us here in this room that believed Jesus Christ was Lord, Savior, and God, we didn't get this from me, Jay Guinan, up here teaching you. You didn't get this from the Bible. You got this from someone else directly. Who? God. God called you. And because God called you, you understand the message as it is, and you recognize who Jesus was. Why? Because Jesus said, I'm the shepherd, and my sheep know my voice. Right? Not everybody knows his voice because not everyone are his sheep. But because they're not his sheep doesn't mean that he wasn't God. It just doesn't mean that. He clearly said he was God here, folks. John 14, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if you had known me, you would have known my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. You know him and have seen him. Why? Because I'm God. We're one. Me and the Father are one. I come from God. I am God. You've seen God. I sure. Jesus answered him, I am the way and the truth and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So from that perspective, no one's getting to God the Father except through Jesus Christ. Nobody. This is not a, a misprint. This is the way it is. And if you had known me, if you had known me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Right? He's clearly telling you, guys. And he, go, you know, he does say this another, well, I'll read it in Matthew. He says the same thing. But he basically goes on. He, Me and the Father are one. We're the same. We're, we're God. All right. Matthew 11, all things have been entrusted to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. What? How is that possible? What do you mean no one knows the Father except you? Well, no one knows the Father except me. Have you seen him? Do you know him? Have you been in his presence? No. You know why? Because you're not me. You know why I am? I'm the Son. I'm God. I'm in him. I'm with him. I'm in his presence. That's the only thing he can be saying here. Me and the Father are one. Nobody knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Again, belief in Jesus Christ, he will reveal the Father to each and every one of us that believe. Matthew 12, if you had known what these words uh, mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, he's quoting God, you would have not condemned, um, I'm sorry, it's brightening out. You had not condemned the innocent for the Son of Man, he's talking about himself, is Lord of the Sabbath. What? Blasphemer! You're the Lord of the Sabbath? No, God is the Lord of the Sabbath. That's right. You got it. You're a smart man. So, 
Is Jesus clearly saying he's God, folks? Yeah, out of his own mouth. I am God. So you're, you have, you're fully free to believe that he's not God. But if you don't believe he's God, you can't believe all the other things he did, said, and promised because if he's not God and he says he's God, then he's freaking crazy. <laughs> this is the bottom line. He's a wacko. And if he's a wacko, I'm not believing any of the other stuff. What, what would make me believe that's real? You get the idea? It's an all or nothing package. It's not pieces. You can't pick and choose the parts about Jesus you think are real and the other parts are made up. That's just not how it works. And finally, in John 8, 58, he says, very truly, I tell you, very truly. Remember when we say when he says, very truly, or listen to me, or you know anything where he gets into that, it's really important. Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Before Abraham was born, I am. Who did God tell Moses to tell Pharaoh, sent him? I am sent you. That wording was very, very specific. It was used to convey the appropriate message. Before Abraham was born, I am. And he was talking to a teacher of the law here. That's why they killed him. The Jews killed him because he kept saying to them over and over and over, I am God. So anybody that tells you that Jesus didn't say he was God are stupid. They don't know the word. And they're just making crap up because it doesn't fit their narrative. He said he was God. Now, your choice is whether you believe it. Your choice is whether you believe it or not. So why doesn't the world believe? Well, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to, uh, but to who... But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Just as Peter was said, you, wouldn't, you, can't, you can't say out of your own will, I'm the Christ, without God giving it to you. You can't do it. You can't believe the message of the cross without God giving it to you. You can't do it. It comes with the power of God. John 20, Jesus says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Now he's talking about, he's talking to uh, doubting Thomas, right? Thomas is basically, Jesus already resurrected. Thomas says, I won't believe it unless I see it with my own eyes. I won't believe it unless I see it with my own eyes. So Jesus shows up. And Jesus says to him, because you have seen me, you believed and are blessed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. That's us. We'll be blessed. We believe in something we didn't even see because of the message of the cross, because of the message of the word, because God has planted that faith in you to believe. Hebrews 11. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That's faith. It's easy to have belief in something you can see, touch, and feel, but that's not what saves you. Faith. Believing in something you can't see, touch, and feel. That saves you. And finally, in First Peter, it says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Now that you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Though you do not see him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice. That's why we come to Sunday. We come to worship in faith a Savior we don't really know. A Savior we didn't see, touch, feel. To a God we can't really see. Yet we believe wholeheartedly that he exists. We believe wholeheartedly that he loves us. We believe wholeheartedly that he loves us so much that he sent his one and only son to the earth to be a perfect sacrifice for each and every one of us, that he died a blameless death, that he was put in the ground, and three days later he, was, he rose from the dead, and he's going to come back. We believe that with nothing more than a conviction that somehow grew inside of us because of a gift that God gave you, each and every one of us. Amen?